Marine scientists are urgently trying to move samples of Florida's coral reefs into tanks on land before they die amid record-breaking ocean heat waves. Last month, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration recorded a reading of 101 degrees Fahrenheit off the coast of the Florida Keys. So for more on this, I want to bring in Alex Neufeld. He's a scientist with the Coral Restoration Foundation. So this is really fascinating to me. We have been hearing that at times it almost feels like bath water, um, you know, when you go to the beach in Florida. Can you explain to our audience um, what exactly is happening when the oceans get too warm? I think we've all heard the phrase coral bleaching, but we don't know really what it means. So can you sort of break down the problems that you're seeing when the oceans get this warm? Absolutely. So the first thing to know is that corals are an animal and coral reefs are made up of hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of these small coral animals. Coral animals harbor a photosynthetic algae inside their tissues called zooxanthellae. And it's this algae that gives the coral its green or brown color. Now, when the water gets too hot, the coral and zooxanthellae the relationship breaks down and the coral expels that algae and it turns white. So what you're seeing now is just the translucent coral against the backdrop of its white skeleton. And that's what we refer to as coral bleaching. So it doesn't look great, but what does it mean? It means essentially that the coral is very, very sick. Mm -hmm. That algae provides the animal with its primary food source. And so a bleached coral is not necessarily a dead coral, but if water temperatures don't return to normal in a short period of time, the coral animal will eventually starve and die. So has, has that happened then since we hit those record temperatures last week, or is it still too warm for the coral there around you? It is unfortunately still too warm. Yeah. And what we're seeing on a lot of reef sites in South Florida is almost complete bleaching of many different species. And unfortunately, it doesn't look like the water temperatures are going to be coming down anytime soon. So we just really don't know how long these systems can hang on. And just sitting here as a layman who probably should know better, but you've got hot weather, hot water, hurricane season heating up mm. or picking up, I yeah. should say. Mm -hmm. Hotter waters means more severe hurricanes. Right. And so when that happens, is that now going to even more detrimentally affect the coral because of the way the water is going to get whipped up, the way the wind is going to contribute to that? Is that just going to destroy it entirely? Well, if we take a direct hit from a severe enough hurricane, yeah, the reefs will be in very real trouble just because of the physical force of that storm. However, hurricanes are a natural phenomenon, and in healthy coral systems, they can actually promote uh, the growth of a coral reef system in the same way that a natural wildfire can sort of reset a forestry landscape. So we don't want to wish a hurricane or a tropical storm on anyone. But at this point in time, that sort of looks like the only sort of system or certainly that level of system is what is needed to rapidly bring down the water temperatures to a more normal level. So it's not that it would wipe out the, the physically wipe out the corals, but by driving the temperatures down, it would at least allow the, the recovery of those corals to begin. Exactly. So okay. long as we don't take a direct hit, and then our issue now is the the physical damage, the breakage, the, the sandblasting of the reefs that happens with major hurricanes. Okay, so hmm. short of a hurricane, um, you know, <laughs> what do we do? It, it, look, the temperatures are not going in the opposite direction, right? They're They're getting warmer. So how do you protect the coral in and around Florida if you're only going to have to put sort of, the, if you take it out, you're only going to have to put it back into an environment that's inhospitable? Well, right. And this is something that we're having to deal with in the coral restoration community, not just in Florida, but around the world. This question of how can you continue to grow and plant coral in a system that is growing year after year more and more inhospitable to mm -hmm. corals. And luckily, what we see in most years, this year being a notable exception, what we see in most years is that the corals still grow really, really well in our nursery systems, which are in the open ocean, many times less than a mile from the wild reef sites that we are restoring. So we're not so much at the tipping point where the water is too hot, the water is too acidic for corals to grow period. It's just that we need to make 
some some slight changes in our methodologies year to year. And this year, that change happens to be taking some of the corals out of the nurseries and moving them into land-based facilities where they could be safe kept while we wait for this extreme heat front to pass. Hmm. So out of curiosity, and this is just, a, you know, as I was thinking about this, um, I was thinking, you know, when it comes to climate change, there, there are sort of the immediate implications, the medium range implications and the long term implications. So immediately yeah. you can take some of this coral out and put it aside. Is there a conversation about introducing corals that may be more resilient to the heat to handle this in the medium term? Yeah, it's a great question. There are conversations about that. And what our organization, what Coral Restoration Foundation has always subscribed to is sort of the, the natural biological principles of resiliency, which state that the more diverse your system is, the more resilient it is. So we might have a strain of coral or even a species of coral that is very, very heat resistant, but we don't know necessarily that that means that coral is also cold resistant or disease resistant mm. or strong enough to withstand the forces of hurricanes. So I don't think we want to necessarily put all of our eggs in one basket moving forward. The same kind of concept as uh, planting a monoculture in agricultural practices, right? You don't want to set yourself up for that one that one off chance where everything goes wrong and now you're left with nothing. So if we can restore a diversity of species, a diversity of genetic strains, we're going to be much better equipped to handle whatever comes in the future, whether that be hot events, cold events, disease outbreaks, or anything else. Hmm. All Interesting. Right. Alex Newfield uh, with the Coral Restoration Foundation. That was fascinating. Yeah. We'll have to talk again uh, as this hot season continues. But thanks for taking the time. Thank you very much.